Hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to our session on students' perspectives of EDI in engineering. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to be presenting. So I'm Sierra. I'm the Vice President Academic of the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students. And Laura, did you want to introduce yourself? Yep. So I'm Laura Stoiko. I use her pronouns and I am the Social Issues Commissioner for the CFES. Great. And yeah, I forgot. Um, I also use she, her pronouns. So if you have any questions throughout um, the session, feel free to use the chat. Um, but we'll also have at the end of the presentation, um, lots of time for questions and discussion. All right. So we'll get started here. And with that, all right. So um, yeah, once again, welcome everyone and really excited to be here. So before we get started on um, the student perspective of equity, diversity and inclusion or EDI, um, we wanted to first define what that is so that we're all on the same page and we can have thoughtful discussions about it. So diversity is usually um, of the three, equity, diversity, and inclusion is usually the most um, commonly known uh, term. And essentially diversity is the presence of difference within a given setting. So, um, you know, oftentimes when we're considering diversity, uh, we look at the diversity of people and their experiences. So that can include their socioeconomic background, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their gender identity and expression, their race, their religion, their physical and mental ability, their ethnicity, and um, their own lived experiences. And diversity is ultimately an outcome that we can achieve. So you can basically measure you know, how diverse um, a group of individuals is based on any given factor. Um, because of course, if you're looking at um, say maybe ethnicity, you may have the same diversity um, as another group, but then if you look at different factors, there may be um, different levels. So um, it is really important to be looking at a lot of different factors, um, not just um, commonly looked at our gender um, and um, ethnicity, but there's so many different aspects of diversity. Um, and of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are so many other aspects of diversity, which makes it so fantastic. Uh, so inclusion is probably the next best understood of the three terms. And inclusion is essentially about individuals with different um, identities that are feeling and or being valued and welcome with in a given setting. So what does that mean? Um, essentially, you know, diversity is that people are there um, and you know, they're part of a group, but inclusion is really making those individuals feel like they're welcome there and that they're meant to be there, not just there to fill a diversity target or to you know, make a group look more diverse. Inclusion is going beyond that and actually you know, making use of their experiences and you know, incorporating them directly into the group. So a classic example um, kind of defining that difference is that diversity is being asked to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So you can even see in that example how you know, diversity, yes, they're at the party and yes, they're part of the group, um, but inclusion is really when they're really fully immersed. And that's ultimately what we want to strive for. Um, and again, inclusion, just like diversity, is actually an outcome that we can um, achieve. So um, we do want to be achieving inclusion in a lot of our, in everything that we, we can. And finally, uh, the last of the EDI terms is equity. And equity is an approach uh, that ensures that everyone has access to the same opportunities um, regardless of barriers that they may face. So oftentimes, uh, you know, diversity may be something that's achievable, but then inclusion may not be fully achievable if we don't look at some of the barriers that individuals are facing, um, whether that be in relation to engineering studies um, or outside of um, engineering and the engineering profession. 
So, you know, ultimately equity is an approach to make sure that we're able to achieve inclusion and that we're able to um, incorporate everyone and make sure that we're able to, to the best of our abilities, reduce the effects of those barriers. So a lot of times equity gets confused with equality. And I wanted to make very clear that they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so equality would represent everyone being given the exact same resources. Um, and it assumes that people are starting with the same resources as well. Um, but we know that oftentimes that's not necessarily the case. And so equity um, kind of goes that extra step and makes sure that, okay, by the end of you know, the reallocating of resources, that everyone has the same resources at the end of the process, regardless of where they started. And so that's a really key um, point and a really key difference between the two. Um, so equity is a process that begins by acknowledging that unequal starting places um, and makes a commitment to correct and address these imbalances. Um, so equity, unlike inclusion and diversity, is not actually an outcome. It involves processes to make sure that, again, we're reducing the effects of those barriers. So now that we have an understanding of these terms, uh, I wanted to talk about the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in engineering, because we're here with National Engineering Month, and this is uh, a week focusing specifically on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I wanted to start first um, on some of our students' um, input on what engineering students value. And so we asked a very open-ended question. Um, actually, this was from um, our first general assembly of our Canadian Federation of Engineering Students, um, which if you're not familiar, we represent over 80,000 engineering students across Canada. Um, and our members are essentially um, engineering societies from accredited engineering schools across Canada. And so we had our members um, basically tell us what they value. And as you can see, a lot of aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion are at the forefront here. Um, advocacy is one of the biggest values of our students. And when we kind of look at the words surrounding that, diversity, inclusivity, um, inclusion, you know, transparency, representation, community, act as activism. Um, these are all really, really important to engineering students. And so having these discussions surrounding the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and accessibility in engineering uh, are really, really important. And they're something that engineering students really do value. It's not just, uh, you know, a hot topic. It's something that students really do want to see in their engineering studies and then bring that as well once they become professional engineers into their engineering professions. So why is this relevant now? So a lot of, you know, when we look at the pandemic specifically and all the events that have occurred since last um, National Engineering Month, um, last March, um, we see that the pandemic has created so many you know, additional barriers, but has also basically opened our eyes to existing barriers that have already been there kind of this whole time. So, you know, during the pandemic, obviously a lot of industries have been in kind of staying afloat mode rather than uh, meeting, you know, other needs of their companies. And so this has caused a lot of companies to, um, leave their equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives completely by the wayside, which is extremely unfortunate because, um, you know, as we'll see, equity, diversity, and inclusion are also key aspects of well-performing engineering companies and making sure that we're getting the best um, voices represented and that we're able to use these voices to create effective designs. And so equity, diversity, and inclusion you know, um, are things that should be valued at the forefront of the engineering profession. Um, but what we saw is that in the face of 
challenges presented by may it be a pandemic or you know other challenges, um, oftentimes these aspects do look get overlooked. Um, there's also, especially in the height of the summer, um, but even still now, um, there's current unrest happening across the world surrounding racial discrimination, specifically against Black, Indigenous, and people of color groups. Um, and we've seen across Canada initiatives happening within individual universities in solidarity of these groups. But again, we've also seen a lot of students speaking out, you know, um, about their own experiences with discrimination, whether it be racial discrimination or discrimination in other forms. And so we see the importance of having representation in engineering and of incorporating um, equity and diversity and inclusion into our practices. Um, additionally, when we think about, you know, across Canada and across the world, a lot of universities have moved uh, their tuition to a remote setting, uh, so online learning, which unfortunately also does introduce new barriers for many students from underrepresented backgrounds um, who may not have access to the same technology as other students or who may uh, be taking courses from a different time zone and they may have to completely mess up their sleep schedule and their living schedule just to accommodate their classes, um, not to mention other factors. So when we take a step back from this pandemic um, and think about how we can move forward, um, it's definitely a key to make sure that we are valuing um, diversity um, and actively seeking equitable practices for not only our engineering education, but for the engineering profession at large. Um, so I touched on this a little bit, but, you know, the pandemic itself um, also did present accessibility concerns. So learning accommodations that may have been available to students in person are often more difficult to find or access in an online environment. Um, students don't necessarily have a direct line of contact with their professors and with their supervisors when they're on work terms. And so you know, that does present additional challenges. Uh, there's the lack of in-person guidance and support, um, and there's also less accountability um, for faculties to operate in an accessible manner in an online setting. Um, so not having that reinforcement of in-person instruction um, and in-person interaction um, when we really get down to it um, does present a lot of challenges uh, for students. So kind of one way that we can combat a lot of these issues relating to a lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion um, is to be teaching future engineers about anti-discriminatory design. So as future engineers, you know, um, I'm speaking as a recent engineering graduate um, and a representative of the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students. Um, you know, for students across Canada, it's really important to be taught about how to make designs inclusive and anti-discriminatory so that when we are presented with challenges, whether it be from pandemics or from um, other issues that, you know, we really can't predict, um, that we're well equipped to address those problems kind of head on um, rather than being kind of in a reactive mode. Um, so designs created by engineers often have lasting impacts on society. Um, and without carefully considering our designs, um, we could be causing discrimination to pervade in societies um, and ultimately including diverse perspectives in the design process as engineers. This ultimately allows for the best, most inclusive designs to be implemented. And so when I talk about inclusive design, um, Essentially at the core is, you know, when we're looking at, you know, the ways in which we're designing technology. So I'm an electrical engineering graduate. So a lot of the technologies that I'm designing or that I'm thinking about have to do with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, personal examples for me of a lack of inclusive design um, are, you know, we think right now in a pandemic with hand sanitizing dispensers. Um, 
whenever I'm out with my dad, who has much darker skin than I do, um, he's never able to use those devices because they can't recognize, oftentimes they can't recognize darker skin tones. Um, and that's clearly a design flaw um, that probably wouldn't have been as overlooked if there were people with darker skin tones on the design teams. Um, another example um, is that people who are designing cars, um, oftentimes the crash test dummies that they use are modeled after typically able-bodied men. And so when we look at crash statistics, women are actually more likely to have fatal injuries when they're in the same kind of impact of car crash um, than their male counterparts. And that's just because of a lack of inclusion in that design process um, and just not thinking about really the impacts of their design choices. And so taking design rather from a reactive approach and seeing that, we wanna avoid that before it even happens. And so one of the best ways is to be incorporating diverse perspectives and um, really thinking about that inclusive design aspect. Um, and so kind of reiterating why this is really important, um, when we look at the engineering code of ethics from Engineers Canada, um, we see that three of the items, uh, five, engineers must conduct themselves with integrity, equity, fairness, courtesy, and good faith towards clients, colleagues, and others. They must be aware of and ensure that clients and employers are made aware of societal and environmental consequences of actions or projects and endeavor to interpret engineering issues to the public in an objective and truthful manner. And engineers also must treat equitably and promote the equitable and dignified treatment of people in accordance with human rights legislation. And when we think about all three of those um, and really the code of ethics at large, um, we see that a lot of this is not achievable without considering aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and really integrating those into the design process. Um, and to really effectively integrate those into the design process, um, these aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, specifically in relation to anti-discriminatory design, are really important to be taught directly to engineering students and uh, to working engineers alike. Because ultimately, um, these uh, kind of ideas and um, practices are constantly evolving and we need to always be ready and work with an open mind um, to be adapting to these necessary changes. So I wanted to highlight a few recent student initiatives, um, engineering student initiatives um, that surrounded aspects of equity, diversity and inclusion. So if you're not completely familiar with um, Canadian engineering student culture. Um, one of the biggest, I guess, prides of engineering students is uh, their patch collections. And so a lot of activism that students do um, is surrounded by patch design. And so I just featured a couple, um, a couple schools who were doing actually fundraisers through selling patches. Um, for the Black Lives Matter campaign. Um, but there's also been, uh, since the summer, these were both from the summer, um, there's also been a lot of different uh, patch designs that have gone to a variety of different um, organizations. Um, just internally within uh, the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students, um, we also had in January a charity auction where we sold not only patches, but a lot of different engineering uh, merchandise. And uh, the proceeds from that fundraiser went to a mental health foundation. And so, you know, that's also really, really important to be considering um, how mental health ties into um, these discussions as well. Um, and finally, I may be a little bit biased because I'm a Dalhousie graduate, um, but one initiative that um, happened at Dalhousie in the fall um, was a survey that was sent out um, essentially asking students if they felt that they were being taught about aspects of anti-discriminatory design um, in their engineering courses and if they thought that it was important. Um, and what they found was that students um, overwhelmingly didn't feel like they were taught a lot about it, um, but wanted to be. 
And so that was something that um, was taken to the faculty um, and they agreed to incorporate it into one of the engineering in society electives that they took. Um, so lots of initiatives going on. Um, like I said, we represent 80,000 engineering students. And so it's almost um, impossible to highlight all of the initiatives, but uh, basically the bottom line is that engineering students are really passionate about equity, diversity, and inclusion in relation to their engineering studies and their future engineering careers. And it's really important um, that we embrace that. So that's it for the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And um, me and Laura are more than happy to answer questions um, at this time. Thanks everyone. Um, sorry, I, I didn't make myself clear. <laughs> if you do have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, uh, but you can also unmute um, and speak your question as well. Uh, hey guys, I have a great, uh, so thanks so much for the great presentation. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering what sorts of actions you, can, you think universities, uh, specifically engineering universities should be taking um, to promote a more inclusive space? Yeah, so I think that ultimately um, one of the biggest challenges is understanding what an inclusive space even looks like um, to begin with. Um, and I think that, you know, constantly getting training and, you know, learning about aspects of um, inclusion and kind of what that looks like in their space and understanding um, their student population um, specifically and kind of the demographics that make up their schools um, because it is quite different, you know, looking across Canada, you know, the percentage of domestic versus international students, um, the percentage of racialized students um, and students from different religions, um, sexual orientations um, and genders. Um, so it's really important to understand kind of their own demographics at their university um, and try to learn about how, you know, their experiences might be shaping their own um, education and really kind of, again, um, I love the word proactive, but really take a proactive approach to, you know, consider um, what barriers they might be facing um, rather than reacting um, and kind of wondering why students from certain demographics might be dropping out at higher rates. Um, we don't want them to be dropping out and we want to make sure that students are feeling supported. Um, and so, you know, really just um, being open and understanding of uh, different individuals' circumstances um, and not expecting the students to, you know, necessarily fully explain their, their lived experiences because um, we also don't want to be putting you know, additional emotional labor on these students. Um, but really, I think it's on the faculties and the universities um, to do their research and um, to do their own learning um, to best support their students. Yeah, Sierra right at the end touched on uh, the one thing that I wanted to add. So I think another really important part is also just um, telling people and ensuring that they're aware of why EDI is important, because at the end of the day, the reason we're doing all of this is just to make people feel included. We, we just want people to make, feel safe. We just want them to feel like they can be their truest and full self wherever they are. And that's what all of this is for. And so really reminding people that at the end of the day, that's all it comes down to is just caring for those around you and just being a compassionate person. Um, and I think kind of taking that approach and kind of showing them why it's so important and how people who have a better mental health, who feel safe in the environment, they perform better in school, they um, are happier and just kind of things like that. Um, and just, yeah, also kind of taking the human approach to it as well. Um, so I see a question in the chat. Um, do you have any advice on how to get the conversation started at um, our own universities? Um, so that's a really great question. Um, and I'll pull a little bit from personal experience um, from just when we 
when, sorry, <laughs> when we had the initiative at Dalhousie in the fall um, when I was still a student, um, the faculty, when we were first um, kind of trying to address um, the lack of education um, from our student perspective on a lot of these issues, um, they were really a lot more receptive when we presented, you know, collective student voices rather than kind of just our society saying that this was something important to students. Um, we actually had student testimonials um, and we also ran a survey um, for students. We didn't have a huge number of students respond, um, about 100. And I think our engineering faculty has um, a, around 2,000 students. So about 5% of the students responded. Um, but even then it's, you know, 100 students versus, you know, five students on the society. Um, it is a lot more. And especially with the testimonials, the faculties um, were really a lot more um, receptive. And so once we had our survey, um, we actually approached each department. So not just um, kind of the overall engineering faculty, but we went to like chemical engineering, electrical engineering, like the specific discipline um, departments. Um, and we were able to speak kind of directly with the, with the heads to understand, you know, where their course curriculum was at, because um, I mean, it's, it's definitely different depending on the university, but um, at least at Dalhousie, the curriculum um, that touched on aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion actually varied quite, um, quite a lot across different disciplines. And so we first wanted to understand what that looked like before we were trying to say, you know, we have a huge lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in our course curriculum. And then the department heads kind of telling us, no, this is actually, you know, we actually are touching on this. So we wanted to first understand the current kind of context. And then um, once we understood that and we had the student testimonials, um, the, the department heads um, and the faculty at large was a lot more receptive. Um, so I see, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say you can move on. You touched, you said okay. it really well. <laughs> um, so I see in the chat, a lot of times I recognize uh, that the discrimination that happens on my campus is not purposeful, but the lack of accommodations that aren't recognized. How do you recommend I approach a student promoting this type of environment? Um, Sorry, I'm just going to reread that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I completely agree in that a lot of the time this discrimination is definitely not um, purposeful. Um, and it's oftentimes due to a lack of understanding of the, the whole context. Um, and that was kind of um, when I talked about those two examples with the soap dispenser and um, the car crash um, test dummies, um, you know, those are examples of where, you know, it, it definitely wasn't blatant discrimination and it wasn't something that, um, or I hope it wasn't something that the designers were intentionally trying to um, cause to happen, but it's just due to a lack of understanding of the whole situation. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about, um, the lack of accommodations um, and you know, recognizing um, the needs of students. Um, I think it's really important um, to be, you know, when students are saying that they maybe aren't receiving the supports that are necessary to them, um, whether that be because they can't um, adequately navigate the accommodations that are there or if um, the accommodations that are available to them are not sufficient. Um, I think it's really important to be listening to the students because ultimately um, it's the students that understand, you know, what they need. Um, and, you know, some of them may not feel um, quite ready to discuss what is completely, uh, you know, what they feel comfortable and what they think that they need for their classes. Um, but an easy way to kind of get a, get a gauge is not to single, you know, any specific student out, uh, but to, you know, at the end, at the beginning, sorry, of a academic semester, just put out a survey to all of the students 
um, asking what kind of accommodations um, that they that they feel are necessary for their course um, and um, maybe not even necessarily even labeling them as accommodations, just asking them what resources would help them um, best in their education. Um, and again, sending that to all students rather than singling out any particular group or um, specific student, I think is really, really important uh, because then students are more likely um, to feel that um, it's not an, a personal attack or anything like that. It's um, just generally a professor and a faculty that's trying best to support their students. Um, Laura, I'm not sure if you have anything to add. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I would say that that was really great. Um, and then um, another kind of maybe aspect of this uh, would be for ensuring inclusive events um, rather than like school. And so um, a kind of trick for that could be um, hosting a session or like some kind of infographic or poster talking about how to host an inclusive event because a lot of people like Sierra is saying they're not intentionally you know um, ignoring groups or anything like that they just don't think about it and so having a poster um, so for example let's say like things are in person again if you're having um, a social event you know have a little wheelchair icon um, on the poster to show that it's wheelchair accessible um, or you know, like a the pride flag to show that you know, like everyone is welcome and accepted. Just kind of like little things like that, because um, people in those groups, um, it makes them feel welcome. It makes them feel like I can be my true self and I can be included at this event. Um, so that would be kind of the more social aspect of it. <laughs> awesome. And um, I see Jana. Um, you have a comment and a question, so feel free to unmute um, now, turn on your camera if you'd like, or um, no worries if not. Hi everyone, um, yeah, so I'm calling in from St. John's, Newfoundland. I teach over at Memorial University, uh, and I actually teach all the stuff that you're talking about. And so first, my comment was you're representing yourselves really well, and I really appreciate the thought and the effort that you're putting into it, the examples that you're talking about. Those are the examples that I draw on as well in my classes. Um, I teach mandatory professionalism and ethics classes. So, you know, everybody's got to do these things. And I also teach electives and this kind of stuff. Um, but there's always that danger of, you know, it just gets kind of shuttled over to the, like the soft skills classes. And I wanted to hear more about either the Dalhousie efforts, you know, to, to get into the design curriculum or other people's experiences as students or, you know, faculty, um, teaching the stuff in technical courses and in design courses. I mean, I just gave a lecture today, actually a guest lecture for a, a capstone design course in mechanical engineering, uh, cause I'm kind of like one of the go-to people about that. But like what barriers are you finding, um, you know, when you're you're getting your faculties to try to talk about this kind of thing? Cause a lot of fa faculty, I think, who are the technical experts might still feel like, well, this is, I know it's relevant, but it's out of my, area and it's really intimidating to try to, to get into that. So I'm just wondering like from a student's perspective, um, what you see, I'm, I, I'm glad to see that there's the appetite there for it, but what you see maybe some of the barriers are for your profs. Yeah, um, and I was actually talking, um, so the initiative that I talked about was from Dalhousie, but um, when we were doing the research for it, we were actually um, talking to a few other Atlantic engineering schools. Um, and so, um, it is something that at least um, whether it's kind of at different levels of implementation, but there's definitely a lot of student interest um, across that region and across Canada um, as well. And um, I think that one of the biggest um, the biggest ways to incorporate it is through those case studies, because I, I know for me, um, when I first heard about um, the, the car crash um, example, um, I was kind of blown away just by something that does seem quite simple to fix. Um, but, you know, it's just something that it, it hasn't been fixed um, in a lot of cases. Uh, and it's, it's still an issue today. And I mean, there's so many examples of a lack of um, consideration of the end user groups and, you know, how their different experiences um, and um, abilities um, would affect their, um, their ability to use our designs. And ultimately, um, I think that it's really important um, to be talking, especially in design courses specifically. Uh, it's harder, I guess, to think about in more of the theoretical courses, but I think 
I mean, especially in capstone, when you're talking about client requirements um, and you're talking about um, design constraints and things like that, I think it's um, that's probably the logical way to kind of take that next step um, and consider not only, you know, the client's requirements, but um, society's requirements and, you know, really considering who is going to be using this um, and not necessarily um, the first user group, but when we go beyond that, um, we want to make sure that at the end of the day, um, everyone can use it. Um, and we want to kind of be addressing um, from that initial design phase, or at least thinking about, okay, if we take this design choice, um, or if we're not considering this um, group of individuals and their experiences, how is that going to affect um, essentially the, the safety of the design and also um, you know, the inclusiveness and the equity um, of that design? And so I think you know, really looking at it from a requirements level is um, a really good, uh, a good tool. That's fantastic. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And, and you, again, representing yourself really well. And the future's in good hands if you're all a part of it. So thanks <laughs> Thank for that. Um, and Philip, I see you have a question as well. Yeah, I just want to ask you, um, so basically, how should we determine how much we should like have equity and I could, I could, eh, accommodations for people? And if there's a standard, like a golden rule for it, and what would that be? Yeah, so I definitely hesitate on saying that there's um, a golden rule because I think that it does completely depend on, um, you know, the demographic of the students. Um, and I'm talking about kind of, you know, university setting, but this can be definitely extrapolated to um, the, the workplace as well. Um, I think it's really, um, Kind of lays on the demographic of the students um, and of the entire kind of university population um, and considering kind of what their experiences are like and basically I mean the end goal is definitely um, inclusion uh, kind of how I talked about at the very beginning and making sure that you know anyone who is at that institution or wants to be at that institution um, especially um, is able to actively participate without, um, you know, without social barriers that are placed upon them or without judgment from, um, you know, their experiences or discrimination. Um, it's definitely something that's very, very difficult um, to, to measure directly. And um, it's, it's difficult also to just, you know, say we want, um, X percent of this group of students to be here. And that will be, um, you know, then we'll be done. Um, ultimately, you know, that's kind of a measure of the diversity. And of course, we do want to promote diversity. Um, but you really can't measure the success until you see that, um, you know, the people from diverse backgrounds, um, and people from all, all backgrounds are able to actively participate, um, and kind of do their best in the institution. Um, so I think that, you know, a really great way, um, is, is just really through, you know, asking the students how they're feeling. And I know that a lot of um, institutions, especially in the pandemic, have had a lot more um, surveys going out to students um, about how they're feeling in relation to their studies. Um, you know, that can be extrapolated to how a student feels if they feel welcome in the institution. And, you know, really asking almost those basic questions um, to students, um, not only when we're in such a you know, unusual time with the pandemic, but just year by year and seeing if there's any, um, you know, maybe there's a trend with a certain demographic of students that aren't feeling welcome. And then, you know, figuring out why that is. Um, and it just really, I, I think it's really important to be having those open dialogues with students, you know, hosting town halls, if that's something that um, is feasible for the faculty. Um, really hearing from the students because you can't necessarily tell um, if your institution is being equitable and inclusive by just looking at the number of students um, enrolled from specific backgrounds. So I think it's really about the student experience um, and the faculty experience, of course, as well. 
Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, thanks everyone. Those were really fantastic questions. Um, and we have a quick poll before, um, before we end off here. Um, so it would be really great. Um, I'll be launching it right now. Um, really appreciate your responses to this poll um, just to see how um, the session went. Um, and of course, if you have other questions um, that maybe pop up a little bit later, um, I'm available via email. I'll type my email in the chat here um, and feel free to reach out with any questions that you have um, later on. Fantastic. And once again, thank you everyone so much for making the time this evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all at future and National Engineering Month activities. Uh, there's activities that are going to be happening uh, throughout the rest of March, um, and there's some really fantastic speakers lined up. And thank you to Sierra. I've been super, super swamped with Capstone. So <laughs> she was an angel and uh, agreed to do most of the presentation, or basically all of the presentations. So <laughs> thank you so much, Sierra. <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everyone. See ya.